Boris and Jason Sun's Jewels and this is Ukraine's home built missile is better than you think. This is ICBM I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, Ukraine just said Zelensky uh, just said like either we get into NATO or you know we'll have to think about getting nukes or something. I'm paraphrasing, not even paraphrasing, I'm just like giving the points here. Right? That's that's what he basically was saying. And his whole point was like we rather get into NATO than get nukes. Nobody wants nukes type of shit. Uh, and to me, it was just like one of those things, like trying to speed up the process in the NATO. Like NATO probably told him, like, ah, yeah, we can't, like, we can't do this. You're, you're under war, and like that's violence, rules isn't that. So trying to like force them into like accepting or something, because I don't think like it ever makes sense, like them trying to get nukes now, because it's one thing to two countries having nuke, and that works as a deterrent against war. But once war is already happening. Where one country has nukes, another is like doesn't, and now try to get nuke. Yeah, the country that has nuke already will basically nuke you, even if you like come close to getting nukes. I guess, right? In, in the process of that, uh, but Russia is no way in hell is gonna just like sit around if they get a whiff of it. Like, oh, they are close to getting nukes. They will respond something like that, and Ukraine knows that. So I don't think they are trying to get nukes or something, but uh, you know they are basically trying to speed up the process of NATO. But yeah, it just like the way he said it felt like a bit of blunder to me. Like, and you know, also like an enforcer video I watched, even to the enforcer. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that was well thought out, uh, you know, well thought out interview or what. But yeah, this is like a, a missile that would carry nuke or something. So that's their home built missile, right? So this all adds up, right? This all adds up. Uh, Zelensky said, talking about nukes, them having this kind of a capable missile, right? This is some strategy right here. So I didn't know like Ukraine had that kind of a missile. I always assume like they're probably gonna rely on like NATO or like US aid or something. This is gonna be interesting. Let's do it. military recently revealed something surprising on august 27 2024 the country announced the successful test firing of their first domestically home-built and produced ballistic missile i think part of what makes this announcement kind of a big deal is that it came out around the exact same time that ukraine's president suggested his country might be considering developing a nuclear weapon if he can't secure a nato security guarantee against a future invasion so follow my logic train here for just a second. I think this domestically produced ballistic missile could potentially have the capabilities necessary to carry and deliver a tactical nuclear weapon. This is something Ukraine didn't have in the past. I should also tell you that Russian President Putin responded to this development saying, quote, Russia will not allow this to happen no matter what, end quote. So as you remember, after Ukraine got rid of their Soviet-era nuclear weapons in the 1990s, they also handed over all their delivery systems, like their strategic bomb. Yeah, so you can say all about like Russia making empty threats here and there, but this is not an empty threat. There is no way in hell that would let Ukraine get nukes, because if they do that, right, Ukraine can basically nuke Russia right now, and UK, Ukraine has been like heavily damaged since the war. Like they're like fuck it, like it, we are the one who's under attack now, right? Our back is against the wall, has been against the wall for a long time now. So they can just do that. So Russia can't allow that. If you're going to ever go for that nuclear deterrent, if you're going to reach for the stars, it's not enough to just develop a nuke. You also need a system that can carry the weight and fire the thing far enough away to not cook yourself in the process. And to be clear, Zelensky went on to clarify his statements that his country is not currently attempting to develop nuclear weapons, but he's also not ruling it out at this point. The point I'm trying to make is that I think all of this information is pertinent. It's something that we need to keep in the back of our noodles as we dive deeper into Ukraine. I think that's a blunder because if he was serious about that, he should have either have some kind of a meeting with NATO in the back doors or something, like back rooms or whatever, or like have a meeting with Russia or something. Not public statement. That, that, that gives, uh, you know, different kind of feeling, right? And that's a blunder because like Russia can just use that as a fuel to recruit more people or even like think about nuking Ukraine and just justifying it because oh look at the Ukraine was gonna do it we were just forced to do it type of way that's kind of fucked up and that's like I was bitching about that once that line is crossed where somebody uses nukes like that's it anybody can use nukes which is the worst scenario I've been thinking about past few months 
right? Look at the Russia-Ukraine thing. Because of that, all the wars are popping up. Because once that happens, like anybody can, oh, I'll do war. Look at the North Korea, South Korea thing is heating up, right? Uh, China is like, just like, I don't know, rumbling or whatever the fuck that is, right? Like, it, you know, like eyeing Taiwan now. Once something happens, like everybody will basically, oh, I can do that too now. Ukraine's claimed new ballistic missile. The first of many questions that pop into my mind is how were they able to manufacture this in the midst of a full-scale invasion against them? How many will Kyiv be able to produce? Will they use their ballistic missiles on targets inside Russia? And how will this possibly impact the wider picture of the war, if at all? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's find out. First, I want to start with a brief disclaimer that there was only really one main source that I could find that was a Ukrainian source for information on this weapon. While the open source intelligence community is pouring over every detail about the new ballistic missile, there's not much capacity for independently verifying the info on a secret weapons project. What that means is I want to forewarn you that the claims here are from Ukrainian officials and they may be exaggerated, they might be mistranslated, or they could be intentionally misleading to throw off their adversaries' operational planners. Take specific capabilities with a healthy dose of salt. That said, we do know Ukraine has been working on developing their own ballistic missile system for a while now. Way back in the ancient days of 1996, they first started on a project codenamed Borisfin to replace hey, don't call me instant, come on. their Soviet era Tochka U ballistic missiles. Ukraine inherited about 500 of the Tochka missiles after the fall of the Soviet Union, and Ukraine wanted a newer system to expand on that 120 kilometer max range of the old missiles, along with the industrial benefits of developing their own domestic arms industry. Based on the capabilities of the last system, we can kind of fill in the blanks a little bit and guesstimate what the new system will be able to do. So the Tochka U fired and operated similar to how the Russian Iskandir launcher does. Its main high explosive warhead for the missile was pretty huge at 420 kilograms or 930 pounds. It's like a thousand pounds worth of explosives. That's like twice the boom of an attack a missile. But the problem is the accuracy because the Tochka U has a circular error probable of hitting within 95 meters of the intended target. To be even more specific, it means 50% of the time you're hitting within that area. So yes, that means 50% of the time it works every time. If you're aiming at a giant base, that might not be too bad, but nowadays we expect higher levels of precision. This is a hint as to what might be upgraded here with the new system. For context, HIMARS rockets have a circular error probable about 10 meters. So what do we know about this new system? And how was its development marred in political intrigue? But before we get into that, I want to tell you about how Armisite went full sicko mode with their new Sidekick 640 thermal monocular device. The reason why I love this Sidekick 640 is because it's lightweight, weighing under 250 grams or about half a pound. Personally, I like to use it helmet mounted, but it's also perfect for handheld use. It gave me crazy visual clarity. Thanks to the Armisite's Iron Wolf technology, it really cleared everything up. What that means is that it has a... Yeah, infrared uh, and all this night vision technology of military is insane. I've seen those like four, what is it like? Tetracular or quadcular, or how are you gonna call it? Like four like binocular style thing. Four monocular, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> that thing like has like a insane like field of view and shit like that. I don't know what the reasoning behind that is. But I was saying like, so, you know, military using that, I don't know where, somewhere, but I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. I need to watch a video on that. Fast 60 hertz frame rate. Whether I was testing it in motion or at rest, the images rendered were freaking crystal clear. I found it useful for surveillance around my place, but I could also see it being awesome for search and rescue or room clearing operations. I was even able to see through smoky, visually obstructed environments with it. Head over to armasite.com or click the link below to check out the Sidekick 640 for yourself and all of the awesome Armasite gear that is sure to revolutionize your outdoor experience. Pivdenia Design Bureau in the city of Dnipro started development of the Boris Fin, which would have had a 100 kilometer and 500 kilometer range versions. 
chronic funding issues and perceived lack of need for such an advanced weapon delayed work on the project until it was canceled by then Prime Minister Viktor Yanukovych in 2003. Just three years later, newly elected President Yushchenko revisited the idea of a ballistic missile in 2006 with a new, more modern scope. But it was done under the new name Sapsin, which is Ukrainian for Peregrine Falcon. The fresh project would be versatile, multifunctional missile capable of engaging land air- Get in, Peregrine Falcon. He goes up and suddenly takes a dive. ICBM, clever. Or, or see targets up to 500 kilometers away. This wasn't as pie in the sky as it first sounds. The Pivdeni Design Bureau had a strong missile pedigree, working on 12 out of the 20 different intercontinental ballistic missiles used by the Soviet Union over the course of the Cold War. 60 different domestic companies with relevant experience would contribute to the Sapsin project, building everything within Ukraine, from rocket motors and the launch vehicle to radar and guidance electronics. But despite an initial budget request of $400 million for the project, the cash-strapped country could only afford around $25 to $40 million, and development of the Sapsen floundered around for the next seven years. Still, the project soldiered on, with lots of design elements borrowed from the Russian Iskandir ballistic missile, and a prototype was ready by 2011. Keep in mind, when we talk about the Iskandir, according to the U.S. Army Tradoc, it is able to fire nuclear warheads. The Iskandir, for reference, has a circular... Look, man, I'm, on most ballistic missiles can you fire nuclear uh, weapon. Usually, that's why they're developed. No, I don't know. But yeah, I think any ACBM can, like, carry nukes, as far as I remember. Oh, you know, this is a secret uh, missile. But when the more detail comes out of it, I won't be surprised if it's more resemble Western American than it resembles something like uh, Soviet style or like that uh, area of thing. Because I don't know, man, it feels like uh, it's, it has a whiff of like Western support to it, right? Like, oh, look at that. During the invasion, they somehow developed an ICBM. Like, oh, great. I'm pretty sure like Americans are like pissed in. Otherwise, you can't just do that. Right, and uh, you know that all the Japanese and all those A's, right? Japan, Japanese A's, yeah, D didn't have like any tag attached to it, like how you can use this aid, right? I'm pretty sure it was very vague, like oh, it's for the aid or like support or some shit like that. Like, you can technically use that for like military purposes and just like it's basically money, use it the way you want type of way, aid. So, I, I guess all those went into the RD, uh, you know, cost and things error probable of hitting within about 30 to 70 meters of where you aim. However, I've seen some other sources that claim that there are missile variants that can hit within 5 meters. So, actual serial production of the missile at scale would have cost significantly more money than Ukraine had at the time though, especially while the country was still reeling from the effects of the 2008 global financial crisis. To breathe new life into the project and attract foreign capital to boost Ukraine's arms industry, an export version of the Sapsin called the Harem went into development. And hopefully I'm pronouncing Herm correctly so I don't get absolutely roasted in the comments. The Herm 2, sometimes called Grom in the marketing materials, had the same overall capabilities as the Sapsin, but with a reduced range of 280 kilometers to comply with that good old fashioned MTCR International Arms Treaty. Saudi Arabia Arabia was thoroughly impressed by the Herm 2, which offered similar performance and features to Russia's Iskandir, but at a much lower price point. That stuff is flying off the shelves. It's bargain Tuesday on Ukrainian missiles out here. But why build a ballistic missile in the first place? What capabilities might this new system have? And how will it affect the battlefield going forward? To give more context on this, here's Diego Asituno, one of our researchers, as well as a former Coast Guard gunner's mate. Ukraine has already been using drones and cruise missiles to great effect since the start of the war, both foreign and domestically produced ones. But a proper ballistic missile adds a few key capabilities that these other long-range strike platforms just don't have. For one, it comes down from a very high angle, basically from space, and it travels just stupidly fast while it does so, above Mach 7 or 5,300 miles per hour. Add in a little bit of maneuvering capacity, and ballistic missiles are much tougher targets to shoot down than something that flies horizontally at yeah, ballistic missiles basically are in the name. It's like a bullet. It's ballistic missile, right? It, it leaves your atmosphere and enters the atmosphere at a ballistic speed. 
it's not so easy to stop and it might have like a longer range right uh russia was warning uk and things like don't let ukraine use that uh, missile system whatever that is right they can hit deeper inside uh, russia a uh, ballistic missiles can go very deep right and it it's very hard like something like aegis system or something like that patriot or aegis can probably like uh, defend against a ballistic missile but yeah other systems might exist on the world that might defend against it but what is the like success ratio to it right ballistic missiles are like bullet like i said that's why they're ballistic so it's it's going to be really hard to like shoot it down when it just like enters the atmosphere and just like spearhead through right and depending on how much damage you want to do you don't even need a warhead or something like that inside ballistic missile has have in, enough kinetic energy that it will like explode as soon as it is, hits the ground at subsonic or low supersonic speeds like those other platforms do. It's not impossible to shoot one down, but it takes a very sophisticated combination of radar system, command network, and high altitude interceptor missile to be able to do it. Things that Russia has already demonstrated some problems with as the S-400 system they've deployed to Crimea to stop Atakums missiles keeps getting hit by Atakums missiles. If the Sapsan, or whatever they end up calling this thing, can reach the 500 kilometer range they want, that's 200 kilometers further than the Atakums missile they've been using which places a lot more Russian air bases, command centers, and supply depots under threat. Further Russian logistics get pushed back from the front, the worse it gets at delivering ammunition, fuel, or even food to Russian troops. And Sapsan doesn't come with any external restrictions about how Ukraine can choose to use it like other platforms. It only takes six minutes for a short-range ballistic missile to reach 500 kilometers. So if Ukraine sees a formation of Russian troops gathering around across the border, they can have warheads on their foreheads within minutes without having to ask Washington for permission first. So even if they only produce a few of these missiles a month, that's a very limited quantity. The fact Ukraine has a free hand to use this weapon however they see fit could dramatically change Russia's behavior at the tactical and strategic levels. The planned export version packs a 500 kilogram high explosive warhead, GPS and inertial navigation systems, terrain mapping and radar for terminal guidance, and the option to mount cluster warheads for a larger area of effect. Saudi Arabia placed an order for the Herm 2 from Ukraine and production started in December 2016, but by 2019 only two launchers and 19 rocket motors were produced and the current status of the orders isn't publicly known. But Ukraine's own ballistic missile venture hit even more snags. In 2013, then Defense Minister of Ukraine Pavlo Lebvidev halted all funding for the Sapsin project supposedly due to lackluster capabilities. Yet this may have actually been an act of sabotage by Russia. Lebvidev held dual citizenship with the Russian Federation and conveniently found himself in Crimea right after being fired from his position in the defense ministry, but also right before the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. In fact, he was in a meeting with Putin in the Kremlin on the day of annexation and has since gone to lead the Crimean branch of the RU, the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs. Ukrainian cabinet minister Oleg <laughs> talking about red handed like is, is there any more red or any more red and it will like basically go to like infrared or some shit. Oh, wait a minute, that's almost it. Yeah, how red can you be? Right? <laughs> it's like okay, dual citizenship. Meeting with Putin while the annexation was happening, like, okay. Sander Sayenko believes Lebedev's cancellation of this Sapsin missile program just before Russia's invasion of Crimea is no coincidence. Quote, Russia was preparing for war with Ukraine and tried to undermine our progress by any means. Sabotage or not, the annexation of Crimea and the ongoing war in the Donbass seriously put a damper on what little funding was left for the Sapsan project. New, more urgent priorities meant Ukraine's defense industry was doing all it could just to maintain their territorial integrity. Their design bureau managed to adapt some of the knowledge and techniques they'd gained from making the Herm 2 missile for Saudi Arabia, but a functional 500 kilometer range missile was still a long way away. A 2021 estimate by Errol Kral, the head of Western Ukraine's defense industrial complex, put the Sapsin program at only 70% complete. Work on the project was even further delayed the next year with the launch of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. It was all hands on deck to repel the initial invasion and no one knew at the time how the battle for Kyiv would play out. Long-term research and development projects like the Sapsan and Harem 2 missiles took a backseat to just keeping Russian tanks as far away from the capital as possible. The issue of only having old Soviet Tachka-U missiles 
first identified as a potential problem way back in the 1990s, had now transformed into a very real nightmare. Not only were the Tachkas outdated, but many were so old that their rocket fuel had gone bad. Of the original 500 missiles, Ukraine had only 90 left in any kind of real operational status by the start of the 2022 invasion. The Ukrainian army had to conserve their limited supply for only the highest priority missions. And even then, their short 120 kilometer range was far outstretched by the 500 kilometer Iskandir M that the Russian military was lobbing at them. The lack of indigenous domestically produced long range weapons was such a problem that some Ukrainians have said that Russia might not even have invaded in the first place if the Sapson had been developed and delivered on schedule. Quote, it's unfortunate that we haven't come up with it sooner if Ukraine had a sufficient number of Harem 2 Sapson operational I mean, tactical I don't know, missiles. Man. You know, I don't know about that. The way Russia invaded Ukraine, the way they thought this would be over before it even starts, like the confidence they had. I don't think a ballistic missile system would have been enough to like deter them, right? I mean, I don't know what effect that would have in real time. Like if they had that, like some invasion happens and if they use that, what effect that would have had? I don't know. But I don't think that would have deterred Russia. Missile systems, we're not sure if Russia would have dared to occupy Crimea or other territories. And quote from Yuri Hinat, the spokesperson for the Ukrainian Air Force. As the full-scale invasion unfolded and Ukraine managed to hold the line, the war morphed into the more steady state that we see today, where large advances by either side come at a high cost. Maneuver warfare was out for a period of time and artillery was in. While that's a bit of an oversimplification, the truth remains that Russia has the advantage in a war of attrition. They have more men, more equipment, more artillery, and more ammunition to throw at any sector until just sheer weight forces Ukrainian troops to fall back. Yeah, more artillery is the main point. I've seen comments in the uh, videos like, oh, artillery, ugh, that's so 50 years old. Like, artillery means something. We have this and we have that. Yeah, it's, it's great to say that on paper, but when actually war starts, like on the battlefield, you actually have to think about things. Artillery is like pretty important, especially war like that. Okay, maybe two major powers like with the insane advanced technologies. And both are at that level major power, like let's say China and USA, if they're to fight, would artillery be that important? I don't know, because both have too many other systems that might be overpowering. But in Ukraine, Russia war, yeah, artillery is pretty fucking important, right? Especially with war of attrition, like you said, like, you know, slowly making progress. Yeah, artillery is going to be one big issue. Back. Western deliveries of arms and ammunition has helped, especially the HIMARS launch platform and attack munitions that could hit Russian airfields and supply depots. Attackums can reach out to 165 kilometers, updated versions can reach 300 kilometers. That was delivered in secret to Ukraine in March of 2024, but these weapons arrived in small numbers and came with preconditions. Anything that was targeted using these or other long-range Western weapons had to be approved by the United States before Ukraine could fire it. Ukraine has had great difficulty striking targets more than 100 kilometers from the front. For their part, Russia has capitalized on this capability gap by keeping large supply depots at a safe distance, while amassing forces or launching their own long-range weapons from within their borders where they can't be hit back. But in the background, it seems that Ukraine has been quietly continuing their own ballistic missile program. Several interviews over the years with Ukrainian military officers and defense industrialists confirmed the Sapsan and Harem 2 projects were still in the works, but slow progress still plagued the program. In June 2023, an interview with Ihor Kroll poured cold water on excitement that the missile would almost be ready, estimating they were only about 70% of the way to a functional prototype, nowhere near serial production stage yet. There's some conflicting reports about how far along the Herm 2 missile is, considering it supposedly entered production for Saudi Arabia back in 2016, so it could be that either these first reports in 2016 were overstating progress, or the process was put on hold when it became clear that Russia's invasion was going to happen. So is the mystery missile from the August 27th announcement the Sapson missile that's finally seeing the light of day? The most prominent theory among defense analysts is that the new missile is the culmination of the Sapson project. Ukraine may have simply had a breakthrough in recent months or were further along with development in 2023. Yeah, to me, it feels more like some other system 
resembling western one why do i think that why why i've been saying this like all everything we heard of in this video like how he was put on hold how he was the 70 percent ready from the prototype back then and all that they can just like in wartime where like that ass is on fire let's just say but every they have to micromanage everything they can just just develop icbm they're gonna need help of the west they've been getting help from the west and if they're gonna get help from the west and like uh, you know, experts weigh in and try to actually help out in any way. They can't help out in like uh, Soviet or Russian style missile, right? Uh, because they don't know anything based on that. So it must be some new type of missile, right? Same issue they ran up when, when it, they were like faced, oh, F-16, how are you going to use them? It's not the same as the Soviet style plane. Okay, now we have to train Ukrainians how to use that. So I bet it's like something more Western oriented, right? So when the detail will come out, it will basically resemble that. At least I think that. Because this kind of a fast progress, it just makes me think like some help is from that direction. Then they were willing to publicly disclose. The head of Russian-occupied Crimea even claimed to have shot down a Herm-2 ballistic missile in May 2023. But there's very little evidence that that was actually a Herm-2 missile, and that claim is heavily disputed even within Russian circles. Still, some explosions at Russian air bases and ammo depots, suspiciously far behind the front lines, had Western analysts wondering if Ukraine may have been testing their ballistic missiles as early as August 2022. According to Ukrainian military news outlet Defense Express, it makes the most sense for Ukraine to actually conduct its tests on Russian targets. Quote, it's difficult to say whether we have a range today where we would have the opportunity to covertly conduct tests of this type of missile. It is unlikely that our Western partners also have ranges at which they would allow us to test ballistic missiles. Perhaps the test of our ballistic missile took place not at the range, I mean, this, <laughs> obviously, uh, this, uh, this feels even weird to point out. Where should we test it? Or oh, I don't know, let's throw them at our people who are trying to invade us. Let's attack Russian key points and see if it works. I mean, yeah, obviously it makes sense. But in real combat conditions, maybe the tests took place immediately on the invaders. End quote. Russia may have provided help in other ways too. As crazy as it might sound, Russia's constant barrage of missiles and drones of various types over the years might have given Ukrainian engineers the extra 10% of information that they needed to finish their design. By the end of 2023, Russia had launched over 7,400 missiles at Ukraine, and that leaves a lot of debris or dud warheads lying around. Even if most of the components are charred wreckage, eventually you find enough in good condition to piece the original design back together. Add to that some collaboration with Western countries, and it's not hard to see how Ukraine's long-running missile program could have been a sudden burst of inspiration. So I want to reiterate, there's no silver bullet weapon system for Ukraine to develop here that's going to change the course of the war. But it will be interesting to see how Ukraine uses this new capability. I want to know what you guys think of it down in the comments. Yeah, I think with this development, they just throw the Hail Mary, like, oh, we might get nukes. Let's put them, put us into NATO or, or whatever, right? Like panicking everybody. To me, it feels like very Russian roulette level shit. It could go bad either way. Who the fuck knows? But yeah, as far as the missile system goes, hmm, that's interesting. I think it's like mostly Western oriented, but who knows, right? And yeah, it makes sense. Like you're at war. Where should we test it? Or oh, I don't know. Let's attack the key points that we want to take out and see if it works. Right? I would say that in the past, like, because of the wartime economy, Russia might come out, doesn't matter how bad their economy is, Russia might come out of it like someone who can produce a lot of military-style things, which is going to make Russia stronger in a way. If Russia, during this war, Russia doesn't become weaker, that might give them a bit of edge, right? Experience, war experience. Look at China. People always say, like, okay, China's all this powerful. But China has never been, to, never been at war, right? In modern times, right? So how powerful is China, this and that? This is experience, right? Experience. So Russia is going to be stronger. But that applies to Ukraine as well, right? Uh, you know, all this uh, thing and developing uh, ICBMs, testing at the enemy, right? It's going to just make them better and better, more accurate, more better, right? More data. It will make them more stronger military-wise. Whatever happens here, in the end of the day, if Ukraine is not... Uh, you know, like, if there's no drastic result either way, some kind of, like, a middle ground is reached, Ukraine will come out stronger as well, right? In military style, I guess, I don't know. 
they would know what to do, how to do. They would have mili military infrastructures and things like that. But yeah. Well, that was Ukraine's home-built missile is better than you think. Well, it's not task and purpose. If you like more, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.